Thank you for attending Policy Matters, conversations about state policy with the Press Herald. This program is made possible with the support of our sponsors. Grow Smart Maine works to give Mainers choices in how to respond to growth and change. Our mission is to support communities in navigating change by convening diverse stakeholders through advocacy and by sharing resources, all in alignment with smart growth principles. Our goal is that current and future generations can choose to call Maine home while living a meaningful life grounded in well-being and economic opportunity. Visit us at growsmartmaine.org to find out more. Bowdoin College is proud to sponsor this series of policy conversations on topics critical to our state. Founded in 1794 at the dawn of the American Republic, Bowdoin has always seen Maine as central to our identity and success. Our history and our future are inextricably linked to Maine, a future that can never be taken for granted. We would not be Bowdoin anywhere else. We would not want to be anywhere else. Maine is at the heart of this college. Welcome, everyone. Uh, I appreciate you joining us this evening. We have a really interesting topic to unfold, I think. And it began when I read a report that was released in February from the U University of Southern Maine. Its title is Economic Security of Older Women in Maine. It's a pretty bland title, I think, as titles go. But the contents were anything but. It was really interesting. It was an analysis of all these various economic indicators and factors that were analyzed through, an, through a lens of gender. And so I don't think it's news to anyone that Maine is the oldest state in the nation. Our median age is 44.8. The US average or median is 38.1. And you wouldn't think that seven years would make that big a difference. But it really does in terms of policy, in terms of services, in terms of demand for services. And when you further analyze our demographics, it's astonishing how women uh, are underperforming on all of these measures uh, compared with men. And so, uh, Strawberry, could you show the key findings slide, please? So th these are the key findings from that report, and I'm not going to go over every one of them, but in every factor, whether you're talking about uh, pay, retirement income, access to affordable housing, health insurance, all of these issues that are so important as we get older uh, show a wide disparity between men and women here in the state of Maine. And in many ways, if you step back and you think about it, after decades of inequities, whether you're talking about pay gaps or you're talking about gender discrimination in the workplace, you're talking about women's work being undervalued compared with men's, uh, persistent low wage jobs that are predominantly held by women that don't have benefits. It's sort of the compendium of all of those factors. They come home to roost when you hit 65. And so one of the most interesting parts of this report is that twice as many women as men are 65 and living alone. It's 50,000 versus 23,000. And when you reach the age of 80, it's triple the number of women who are living alone. And of course, living alone has all kinds of repercussions in terms of your economic security. So, this report is really, really, to me, very interesting, very sobering. Um, we have it on our resource page. Maybe some of you saw it when you signed up for this webinar this evening or this forum this evening. Um, I would encourage all of you to read it because it really will make you think about where we're going as a state, in particular with our aging populations. Thankfully, we have two really good panelists to talk about this, to analyze the analysis, so to speak, and to talk about areas where maybe there's some policy directives we can embrace, maybe there's innovation that we can adopt. So I hope that at the end of this evening, 
you'll have learned something and you may be motivated uh, to take some action to see if we can address some of the issues that were, um, that were highlighted in the report. So let me introduce our panelists. First, we have Desti Holman Sprague. She is the executive director of the Maine Women's Lobby. Desti joined the Maine Women's Lobby as executive director in 2020 after 11 years with the Maine Coalition Against Sexual Assault. While at Maine CASA, she served as associate director supporting the agency's work to identify and meet strategic goals to prevent and respond to sexual violence, exploitation, and trafficking, and to change systems and public policy to reflect a more just, equitable, and victim-centered name. Desti's passionate about organizational infrastructure, policies, and practices that reflect anti-oppression and feminist values. And also joining us is Jess Maurer, she is the executive director of the Maine Council on Aging. She manages and leads a broad multidisciplinary network of more than 130 organizations, businesses, and community members, working to ensure we can all live healthy, engaged, and secure lives as we age in our homes and in community settings. In this role, she advances statewide public policy initiatives provides leadership within Maine's aging network and supports Maine's legislative caucus on aging. A licensed attorney, Jess worked for 17 years in the Maine office of the attorney general before leading the Maine area agencies on aging, which is just, I think, one of the most difficult organizational names to pronounce. She co-founded uh, the Council on Aging in 2012 and became its first executive director in 2018. So welcome, Desti and Jess. And just a, a little bit of a full disclosure here, folks. If you detect a certain familiarity in my questions to Jess, it's because we're neighbors and we've been neighbors for 10 years. So, uh, so I know her pretty well. So let's get the ball rolling. Um, the first question I have is this. We all know that Maine has the oldest median age in the country, as I mentioned in my introductory remarks. But what does that mean? from a policy and an impact point of view. So I'm asking if you could both weigh in on that and maybe provide a specific example or two. Um, and let's uh, have you just start that conversation. Sure, and um, I just wanna say thank you uh, to the Portland Press Herald for hosting this conversation. We're really excited and thanks to all the people who joined us, including Kimberly Snow and Elizabeth Patine I've seen who are our two major drafters of the report. So thank you. And also Ruta Kadnoff, who's here from the Maine Health Access Foundation who is the funder for this report. So I just wanna thank uh, all of those folks uh, and, and there are a number of uh, other folks here um, so who are doing some really great work around anti-ageism work um, so I'm excited to uh, have you all here and it's sort of a team approach, even though it's Desti and I who are talking. <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, I just want to back up for one quick second and say, I think it's not all about age. Um, and uh, when we hosted uh, almost a decade ago, the speakers round table discussion on aging, Charlie Colgan was our lead off uh, speaker and he said, if we had put an ankle bracelet on every child born since 1980, such that they could not have left the state of Maine, we would have the same workforce shortage. Mm -hmm. his, his bottom line was, we just haven't had enough babies. And that's true for the last 40 years. And so it is a combination of not having produced enough people uh, to replace the workers who are now leaving the workforce. Um, and so we, and, and couple that with an unexpected, and it really wasn't that expected, um, very healthy longevity. Um, mm -hmm. And so we're living longer than ever before. And what we're doing, so here's, here's a concrete example, as you're asking for, uh, in, in relation to policy and, and why we're talking, why the last forum you had was on housing. This is the reason, is that a lot of older workers are leaving their jobs. Uh, and they have no intention of leaving their homes and in fact plan on staying in their homes until they die, which could be 30 years from now. Um, and so we need new workers. We just, I just said, we haven't had enough. So we need to attract new workers in. There aren't any houses for them. Um, and so there hasn't been that normal cyclical turnover. And I don't want to be, you know, morose, but, you know, 
our our life expectancy was shorter and so when you stopped working you know you lived a little while you died your house turned over and and it was okay and we've kind of disrupted that with this whole longevity which is really great right we're all happy to be older <laughs> longer healthier lives that's really good um but so you know we've got that problem we don't have enough housing for workers on the flip side um, because we're living longer than ever before, our traditional housing doesn't work for us when we get into our 80s and 90s. Sometimes it does, but a lot of times for a lot of different reasons, whether you can't drive, you can't afford the property taxes, you can't go upstairs and the only bathroom is upstairs, right? We have now what's a big housing mismatch. We have a bunch of older people living in houses that don't work for them, but they also can't find housing that meets their needs. Um, and, and so I know we're gonna talk, but that's just one very specific concrete example of sort of how our demographic shift, and that's really what this is, a big demographic shift has resulted in our need for big systemic change. So I'll leave that there. Okay, so you, you opted to look at housing for the policy and the impact. Desti, what do you, what do you, is there a particular um, policy that you can think of that really reflects the fact that we're the oldest state in the in the nation and what that means sure yes i'm happy to thanks uh and thanks for having me i'm happy to be here and thanks to folks in the audience um i think this is a really important conversation and one of my favorite things to talk about to be honest um because what this report does is helps us put into context not just the experience of older folks in maine but how we got there over the lifespan, you know, multiple policy choices that lead to this conclusion across, uh, you know, across generations. Um, so the thing that I want to talk about or focus on, and you'll hear me again and again tonight come back to this, is the issue of care and caregiving, family caregiving, personal care, child care, elder care. And in general, as a society, we don't do a great job attending to care infrastructure. Um, that's a policy choice we make. We're the only country in the world, essentially, that does not have paid family and medical leave, for instance. And, you know, we make that choice. That has ramifications when we think about an older population on a couple of fronts. First, it means that um, older folks are more likely, older women are more likely to enter old age, um, older, their older years, um, having dedicated a lot of their life energy to care work, often unpaid care work, or they've left the workforce as a result of that care. And so that means they have fewer resources available to them. There is also a care need on the other end as people approach the end of their lives, they need more care. And because we have a larger population of older people in Maine, that means we know that there is a demand for more care work, whether that's unpaid family care or whether it's direct care and the direct care workforce. Um, on both of those fronts, it's really a gender equity issue because the people providing unpaid care and the people providing paid direct care are largely women. And we know that that direct care workforce is really underpaid and undervalued. So we're putting women into positions of being underpaid and undervalued throughout their lifespan. So just because you, you brought this up, Desti, let me, can you give me an example of another country that doesn't have that policy where, um, where care is either paid or, um, it, it's provided, I, I'm just curious, like, can you think of an example of a country that's dealing with care in, in the right way? Uh, every country, but Papua New Guinea has a system of paid family leave. Wow. So they're, or they're, it is unquestionable that some of them do a better job than others. You know, we can look to countries like Finland that provide, you know, a year of care to um, not only, this is not only just about babies, like in the context, and I think sometimes people hear family leave and they think babies. Mm -hmm. um, really family leave folks are just as likely to need to care for 
an aging parent, an aging spouse, for themselves. Um, and, you know, countries like Finland, though, that provide a year of leave for care for a family or family member, as well as providing um, supports for the direct costs of that care. Mm -hmm. There are real costs associated with providing support to a family member, and that's usually coming out of people's pockets. So it's getting you on both sides. Right. Yeah, go ahead, Jess. I, I was just going to say, I, I, I mean, I just had reason because of this forum to, to talk with Don Harden, who's also on our call, and I think maybe he's with his wife, um, who had to leave, you know, the, didn't have to leave, but left the workforce, or his wife, uh, to take care of kids and then left the workforce um, to take care of her mom, um, who had Alzheimer's, uh, and, um, you know, conversely is receiving the least amount of Social Security um, that she could, right? And also because she left the workforce has not been able to enter higher paying jobs um, as an older worker. Um, and they just came back from France visiting their grandchildren and their daughter, um, who's left the workforce a couple of times now, um, got paid and, you know, got reimbursed and paid into Social Security during that period of time, during that absence. And that's the way, right, it should be. We shouldn't be penalized. It's an actual, we are actually penalized for taking care of people. So it's not, you know, in, in so many different ways. So then let me ask you, what, what are some of the policy um, directives that, that you're advocating for that are based on the results of this, um, of this study? Um, and maybe, uh, I know that for a lot of the information that was distilled, it was predicated on women who were living alone, who are healthy, and who own their own homes and are no longer, longer paying a mortgage. So in a sense, the, the sort of the foundation of it is already um, economically, uh, you know, shored up compared to what's the reality for, for a lot of people. So I'm just curious, were there obvious policy changes that you're advocating for based on the results of this study? And Dusty, do you want to start that one? Take that one first? Sure, I'm happy to. You know, part of what I really enjoyed about this project, and in general, what I enjoy about my partnership with Jess and MCOA, is that I think we do a really nice job of being able to look across that lifespan. Mm -hmm. And so I'll I'll start with perhaps the earlier years, and Jess, you can take it home with <laughs> um, aging specific policies. I think about the kinds of factors that either keep women um, underpaid, women and care, caretakers and caregivers generally, but that keep them underpaid or undervalued or in general um, accessing fewer resources than uh, they might otherwise. And so the kinds of policy proposals I would be thinking about are the ones specific to care, like I just talked about. And that's, you know, paid family and medical leave is right at the top for me virtually every person needs to access leave from the workplace at some point in their lifetime. That's not only the loss of their paycheck, um, but it is also the loss of paying into social security and a disruption to their career. So it has multiple levels. Um, I would be looking at policy uh, solutions that support unpaid care like social security tax credits or direct reimbursement for costs associated with care. Um, and then access to more paid time off to, to care for herself or other, like the new paid sick leave that Maine has instituted. That's only 10 days though. And we know that 10 days is just, is not getting there for long-term illness or support. And then I would also be looking at the other kinds of issues that contribute to gender inequity. So we know that women are still in general underpaid or undervalued as compared to men. Um, that is particularly true of women of color. We talk about sometimes the 80 cents or 79 cents on the dollar, that's for white women. You know, Latinx women are making 57 cents on the dollar for white men. So there are, there are policy solutions around pay transparency and pay equity that we can continue to pursue. We've made some progress, but it's not showing up in the numbers yet. Um, 
And then there's a real problem with pay equity that is not about differential in a company, but rather it's about the differential in spheres. Uh, so direct care or predominantly women specific uh, fields like direct care tend to be underpaid and undervalued. And as this report showed, the research is clear that when women enter a field, the um, total compensation for that field decreases. It, that is a mind blowing statistic. So we are culturally undervaluing women to the extent where it's having this sort of backwash effect. So we can be putting into place uh, systems that make sure that there's pay equity across different fields uh, so that we're raising women up, <laughs> not depressing different specific fields. So one of the one of the things you just mentioned, Dusty, is the idea of having social security tax credits. So is that something? I mean, how does how does that look like? Is that where okay, you took uh, eighteen months off from your job in order to care for an infant or in order to care for an aging parent, and instead of just having this big gap in your social security. Uh, you know, calculations, you're able to get a tax credit for that time once you reach retirement age? I mean, I, I'm, how does that work? I think that there are a couple of different models for it. I mean, obviously, when we're talking about making a specific social security change, we're talking about federal right. policy change, and that always gets more complicated and more, um, you know, we're talking about real long-term effort. But there are smaller and more accessible initiatives. For example, um, Representative Cloutier of Lewiston put in a proposal in uh, the 130th legislature that was essentially a pilot project to support people's unpaid care, where people could you know, indicate and demonstrate that they had had to leave the workforce or reduce hours at the workforce um, in order to provide unpaid care labor for a family member. And this was essentially a, you know, a $2,000 credit that would be available to them. So it is not a replacement of their income, right. but it's a $2,000 either credit toward lost wages or credit toward um, hard expenses associated with that care. Um, so I think that there are a lot of ways that we could get creative about it without thinking about necessarily having to change, you know, our social security infrastructure. Because yeah. change is so easy to do in Washington. Right. <laughs> yeah, yes, and, right? I mean, we <laughs> do change it, and we do things like, yes, I want to, you know, give money to the presidential campaign. We do change our tax policy a lot, actually. Um, and so uh, making it easy, you know, creating a threshold for someone to be able to say, and we, we believe all kinds of people, right, who are self-employed when they put information in, saying, you know, I did this and therefore you're going to get the base level social security is just going to be credited to you um, for this period of time. I actually don't see that as very complicated, um, particularly not when, I mean, we're, we're having this conversation like there isn't a downstream cost, right? There is a downstream cost here, a big one, a big one. I mean, if you want to look at the big picture, right? Three, uh, three, three quarters, uh, two thirds of Maine's cost uh, for Maine care is related to long-term care. Um, and, you know, if people, um, and particularly women, because we're looking at the economic status of women, are able to afford their own care, which is completely unaffordable for most of the women we're talking about in this report. Um, if they were able to afford it, then we wouldn't be paying it. So, you know, again, we're talking about, you know, where is there an ounce of prevention that might actually result, A, in people living healthier, happier lives <laughs> without having to make decisions about, do I heat my house? Do I take my drugs? Do I eat a meal? which is what people are doing. Um, certainly I can't afford to pay, you know, the cost of repairing my home, um, you know, and, and then ultimately, so I have a less, you know, full life because my economic status isn't that great. Uh, and then uh, I'm going to, I'm going to be a burden, cost burden um, to, uh, you know, to the system, which doesn't have to be that way if people have adequate resources. Um, and so we're talking about, 
um, you know, uh, historic uh, gender-based discrimination that results in significant costs to our economy. Um, and so we should not miss that point <laughs> on, on that. Um, and I'll just, you know, chime in on a, on a couple of the policy um, pieces. Um, and, you know, I'll, I'll sort of piggyback on, uh, first of all, everything Desi said, yes. Um, and then, you know, I think it's, it's really important that we be, you know, as we are sort of on this journey of looking um, at equity and, and looking at these, you know, sort of issues, we have to see that we have um, valued this workforce from a really a dominant white, you know, male um, perspective by saying that this is a dead end. As long as I've been in this job, I have heard these are dead end jobs, right? So women's work equals dead end, right? They're caring jobs are not a value in and of itself. They're only a value if they lead to a healthcare job. So sure, it's okay if you come in to be a CNA, as long as you're gonna go be a nurse. But if you're just gonna be a CNA, then it's not a value. The other things you know, that I think about, we've talked about doing, for instance, market-based analysis. What does it cost, right, to provide Good quality. We know we're not talking. I want everybody on this call to know we are not talking about this. We can all agree on a couple of things. No care is not good care. <laughs> and right now, you can't access home care because there aren't enough workers. And so we ask the question what do we have to pay? What does that pay level have to be to attract an adequate workforce? to deliver care in the way that we would like to receive care, right? We, we would all like to have consistency and caregiver. We'd like to know that when they're supposed to be there, they're gonna be there and they're, they're trained and competent to deal with Parkinson's or um, dementia or whatever it is we're dealing with, right? All of those things seem really reasonable to me. Um, and what would it cost to do that? And what I've heard is, well, maybe we'll do a market-based, but there's not enough money to pay for it. Right, so we come back to um, it doesn't matter, right? That this is women's work, that it's been undervalued for all this time, that we've put a false dichotomy on on its value, um, and we just can't afford that. Um, and I I say that's not necessarily true, um, and we need to figure out how to start thinking about um, um, how we can afford it. Um, another piece uh, that I want to mention, and just again piggybacking on on the discrimination and, and sort of dealing with that, we have to get a handle on, on gender and age discrimination in the workplace. Um, and we have um, embarked on a conversation with employers across Maine about age bias um, that have led us to hear intentional stories of age discrimination. Um, and, uh, and, and so, you know, understanding, I think, so some of this is like really, um, uh, getting some women mad about these situations and starting to file suits um, in a different way um, to really open the eyes of employers um, that they are making decisions based on bias um, to pay people less, um, to offer them jobs that they're, uh, you know, um, <laughs> that they are way under their um, abilities um, because they don't want to pay their insurance. I mean, these are all real things that happen when, when women leave the workforce and then come back, they cannot get a job at the same level that they've been working at in the past. And we hear all the time, we can't afford older workers. Um, you know, sort of this idea that they're, they're too expensive. Um, and so won't even, uh, won't even consider them actually, won't give them interviews. Uh, we hear conversely that older women are consistently changing their resumes, right? They, they drop their years of graduation, they drop ex work experience, they color their hair, they, I mean, they're covering, right? They're trying to be younger um, so they can at least get in the door and, and prove that they're qualified. So there's a lot, a lot, a lot of bias-based discrimination going on in our workplace. Um, then finally, you know, get, let's get to the older people who are living without enough money to meet their basic needs, the older women who are living without enough money to meet their basic needs. We I would like to, and we will be investigating over this, you know, next few months, what it would take to change our eligibility standards for some of our benefits in Maine. So our long-term supports and services benefits to use the economic uh, elder security index instead of the uh, federal poverty level. Um, index, which, you know, I'll just give you a concrete example. 
the Medicare savings program um, is an incredible benefit for older people, low income people. Um, but, you know, it ends the benefit, the, any eligibility for the benefit ends somewhere around, please don't quote me on this, seventeen or $18,000. It's got a value of $5,000 because of all kinds of things that you get if you get it. Social Security pays your Part B and you get this low income subsidy, which is like $100 a month. So it's worth a lot of money to be on the Medicare savings program. You actually would go from 18,000, you know, to 23,000, which is getting you much closer to that number of where you might be able to afford most of your needs, not all of your needs, most of your needs. Um, so thinking about how do we raise the eligibility limits, again, we're going to have to talk about how do we pay for them. Um, but we need to be having this conversation about, about gender-based equity in a way that we haven't been having it before with the legislature. We have to be clear about the impacts of historic um, discrimination and ask for equity for women as well. So just the first point that you made um, about uh, care workers. Do you see like it, what I know that there was a there was an attempt in the last legislative session to try to address the historic underpayment of, of uh, people who are providing direct care. And honestly, I can't remember where that settled. I know that I know that the uh, child care workers were able to get to win some um, benefits and and pay uh, in, in terms of that industry, but I don't remember the outcome of the direct care. So like uh, from a policy, I mean, if it's being discussed in Augusta, then what needs to happen to make, to make that happen so that we are able to begin to address the paucity of people who are able to, to take the, that work, even if they want to take that work? Uh, absolutely. And by the way, I, I want to just stop on that piece. The people who are in the direct care workforce um, are special, special people. Oh, they, absolutely. They are carers. They are people who are in these jobs. And in fact, we just talked to a whole bunch of them. And that's what they said. They said people in these jobs should only be in these jobs because they care. They're actually worried about too much money. They don't want to attract the wrong kind of people. So, <laughs> you know, like they, they don't want people to just want these jobs because of money, but they do want to be paid a fair salary. So let's just, um, I want to just say that out loud because I want to value them. Um, yeah. But um, So I want to also just give a shout out to the, to the main legislature who has done a really nice job. I mean, they, we, you know, they created the commission to study long-term care workforce issues. Um, they met in um, the fall of 2019. They did a very good job. They made uh, have a report with tens of recommendations. And one of the, the core recommendations was that all of the reimbursement rates um, for all workers in this category across all settings, um, that the labor portion of the main care rate be set at 125% above minimum wage. Um, and um, and that it always stays there. So it's 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 increasing the salary floor, right? Um, the problem is that um, for whatever reason, it was a problem with colas at the same time, and and this law, the the amount of money that the department said they needed and the legislature appropriated wasn't enough, and so they did nothing. I mean, that's I want to be clear. And so workers were kind of demoralized because the end of last year, there was a press release that came out from the governor's office said, hey, we're doing this great thing. And then in January, we got a note from the department saying we don't have enough money. So it'll be in the supplemental budget. We need more. And so a lot of workers left the field. I mean, that felt very much like a, mm, you know, like a you know, jerk a dog who's on a leash, you know, like uh, we're we're going to give you something. Oh, wait a minute. Not now. Uh, and, and providers were really, you know, sort of not in a great place um, with that happening. Um, and so this legislative session, they fixed it mostly, um, but not all. And again, it's a real problem. You know, the, um, the, the nursing homes were left out of the fix. Um, and it's something about how complicated it is. All of this is very complicated. I just want to be like very clear what I just said. The department is doing an incredible job and they have they, this administration in particular was the first administration that came in and said, main care is a nightmare, right? And we have absolutely no basis for establishing any rates in Maine. We just did it. We had no basis for any of the rates for doctors, nurses, phlebotomists. I mean, it, it's not just about direct care. Like 
we had no basis. And so they established a rate care setting process and God bless them for doing this. You know, so I really appreciate, I, I don't want to, they have been, and they, they have been implementing all of the recommendations of the commission to study long-term care workforce. And I want to make it sound like, but it's not enough. And more importantly, we've been having, we're having the wrong conversation because we're not having the bias conversation. We're not having the conversation about, yes, all of these other people aren't getting enough money either, but this is uh, uh, a, um, an injustice that needs to be righted. And we're not having that conversation. That's the conversation we really need to be having. So lots of good stuff happening. Don't wanna pretend that there isn't, but it's been a long journey and um, a lot of direct care workers left the workforce. So it's just a little, um, I guess it's a little surprising to me to hear that we don't have the money for it when almost all the other uh, policy matter forums that we've done over the last two years have been predicated on, hey, there's a whole bunch of money coming from the federal government, the American Rescue Plan and ARPA and, you know, uh, like millions and millions and millions and millions of dollars. And so I don't know, I, I don't want to editorialize, but it sort of seems that if this issue can't get funding, it's just another example of the undervalue, um, the attitude of undervaluing this work, which is, I think, really dangerous given how old our population is and how we are aging, you know, at, at a pretty good clip here. So it's in our own self-interest <laughs> to, to take care of this. It's in our own self-interest. And I, I think, you know, I mean, the, the basic uh, problem has been, and we can, we can, I mean, it always comes down to this, is that the fix has to, is, it has to be in the structural budget. And so the money that has been coming in through ARPA and federal funds is one-time money. Mm -hmm. um, and the department has done what they can with the one-time money to try to address this, but this is going to be a big price tag that has to go into our, you know, baseline budget. Um, mm -hmm. And I totally agree with what you're suggesting mm -hmm. um, yeah. is that it is, you know, it, it's just a continuation of bias mm -hmm. um, that we don't prioritize investing in this workforce, which again, <laughs> nationally, lots and lots of good people have done the work to say, if you invest in this workforce, it's really good for our economy. Uh, increasing the household income of workers, building a strong workforce, right? Making that workforce predictable, whether that's in, you know, in, in child care or home care, right? Or, or nursing home care, making that predictable doesn't, um, it doesn't lead to nursing homes closing. I mean, we've had so many nursing homes close and, and it's because of staffing shortages, you know, and, and it's again, where are the costs? We have older people, a hundred each in, in you know in in main health system and in in northern light system i'm sorry east uh, yeah no yeah northern mm -hmm. light, northern light system um a week older people a week who can't be discharged to home or to hospital or, or to to home or to a nursing home because there aren't enough workers a hundred people a week in both systems, more wow. than, I mean, they, yes, Northern Light did a whole briefing for the Appropriations Committee on this issue, and it's just direct care workforce issues. And so we're going to be looking at, hopefully, with the main Center for Economic Policy, what's that costing us? What's the cost of doing nothing? Because we need to answer that question. Um, and, and I'm sadly moving away from this, <laughs> you know, I mean, we're, we're saying uh, if we're not going to be able to crack this on an equity or an injustice, you know, or a gender bias, um, we can at least talk about money, right? Um, and 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 if it's costing us more to do nothing, then we need to invest differently in this workforce. Wow. And I would even, you know, to to expand it out to the the bias, you know, writ large around gender equity. So much of our economy for so long has been predicated on you know, before, uh, before women entered the workforce more globally, you know, in, in making sure that you had women at home providing all of the home care and child care and elder care that our communities needed and which were required to make the economy run. And, you know, when then women, primarily white women, because white women were the ones not in the workforce, just to be clear, 
Um, but when they've entered the workforce, we have refused to build in the systems, you know, more comprehensive systems like child care, elder care, um, paid family leave. Uh, and so we then expect for women to just continue carrying on this burden because they have. Uh, and it, it, as somebody mentioned in the chat, you know, we do continue to make investments in the priorities of many policymakers. Mm -hmm. We did have a budget surplus this year. Mm -hmm. It could have been ongoing money, and we could have made different choices about it. A mm -hmm. lot of people hoped to, and I'm not throwing anybody under the bus here, but it is a failure of imagination mm -hmm. to, you know, make the choices that we need to make to have a more um, comprehensively supportive supportive and equitable community structure. Mm -hmm. I think these are all really good points. Um, and, I'm, and I'm reminded of our, our last Policy Matters Forum addressed affordable housing, uh, which has tremendous impact for aging Mainers as, as we alluded to earlier in this conversation. And it was the one topic we got the most questions about uh, from the folks who registered for, for this event. And so I'm, I'm wondering, do you have specific suggestions on either a policy level or on a practical level to help address affordable housing and, and aging populations? One of our attendees asked if anyone is looking into creating older women's co-housing and co-living situations. Could there be a few villages of tiny houses for older independent women? Um, are there any services that support women to pool their money, buy a house, hire a cook, a cleaner, a visiting nurse? I mean, I, I think that people are really um, trying to be creative in terms of how to address the affordable housing uh, conundrum. We're, we need about 25,000 units of affordable housing a year, and we manage to provide just about a quarter of that. So, uh, so what do you think? Would one of you like to jump on that? I'm happy to, um, and uh, and and we we actually did a, a, a host a whole day conference on um, uh, housing for Maine's new age to sort of think through some of these things, including that more. Uh, and it wasn't it wasn't specific to women, but it, you know in general. So we've thought a lot about the housing um, shortage, and I will say there's um, many different uh, things. It's important to notice to know that there's difference. Um, about public funding and private funding. And public funding can't do those sorts of things, you know, just, just for women. Um, uh, and, uh, and so, or we're right back to, to you know, gender-based discrimination. Um, and so it's got, that part is gonna have to be a private solution, but there, um, there are, first of all, this report tells us um, if we, it actually gives us a really good look to say, if we look at this eligibility limit for anything, we're mostly helping women. Who are mostly helping women who are living alone. And great, right? I mean, so we can actually drive some of this policy um, that is, you know, just around eligibility and you and and you you help more women. But in terms of housing, um, there is a home share program. There are lots of home share programs nationally, models that work. Um, Vermont has had one for more than 20 years. We've had them, we've gone over there, they've come over here. Lots of people have been interested. We just haven't found exactly the right host for this uh, program, um, but it's a perfect thing. And, and we've said this all along, right? It's a, it's a matching program that matches mm -hmm. um, very intentionally. They've been willing to share every document they've ever created. It matches people so that if you like pets and you wanna live in a house, if you're quiet, if you like music, you know, whatever those things are, it puts, you know, somebody who has a house with somebody who needs a, a house, right? Does that sound familiar? We've got a lot, that, a lot of that going on right now. Um, and it does stuff like it matches them. And then there's a contract. And then, you know, there's, there's a mediation component if there's problems. And they actually help get people out if, if it doesn't work. Um, and so, you know, that helps a person who wouldn't otherwise, um, right, um, that helps a person who wouldn't otherwise open their door to somebody to have um, trust that if they do, um, they can, you know, they can, they feel like they can manage the situation and that maybe actually be good for them, right? It's, it's so, I think there's a lot of opportunity um, with home sharing. 
Um, there are many other, um, and, and by the way, here's one concrete example of something we could do. Um, what we have, right, are colleges and universities all around Maine. Um, and, uh, and, and before she left the state, unfortunately, Carol Kim, who was the vice president of the university system, was actually looking at doing this, particularly in Orno, where they have a housing shortage for their students, right? So you've got a bunch of people living in big houses in Orono alone, and you've got a university infrastructure that helps students manage housing. Like, couldn't we take the home share program and put it with our universities and our, you know, our community colleges and help uh, students in ever, uh, many other countries, uh, intergenerational living in colleges and has become a thing. Um, they develop it, you know, but we just, we haven't, we haven't gotten there yet, but we could, and because we have rural, we don't, you know, we don't have big apartment buildings and that sort of thing. Like, let's use what we have. So that's one potential solution. Um, accessory dwelling units is, you know, another. And so we're really excited, you know, by this law that's been passed that is really expanding that. It's a really important piece. Um, it's better for us to stay in our communities when our homes don't work for us. And again, this creates a win-win opportunity. It's not for everybody, but for some people who have, you know, equity in their homes and, you know, an, the enough wherewithal to do it, they can build, you know, a second home that meets their needs, right? A, a universally designed small home, thousand square feet. It's enough for two rooms and it can be, you know, ADA compliant, doesn't cost that much money. And then you can rent your house to pay for it, right? I mean, this is makes good sense all the way around. If you don't want to do that, you can have a management company rent your house so that you don't have to, and you get to stay right where you are with your community, right? These are all, it's a win-win situation. Um, and then, you know, we're just, we're, I think we're limited by our own thinking. I just was down at the Leading Age uh, Maine and New Hampshire conference, and I heard this guy, uh, I'm going to forget the name of it, but I'll put it in the chat, um, something homes. Uh, anyway, he is a, he's a builder and his wife, his, his wife is an architect and they first built um, housing because there was none for their assisted living facility. And they built seven units and um, on the property that they had the assisted living and it filled right up and they had a wait list for another seven people. And so he went to the town of Dover and got permission to, to build 45 small homes in a pocket community. And he's doing it for $90,000 a home. I'm like, hmm. Okay, <laughs> we, we're not thinking right, right? I mean, we, that's something we could be doing here. Um, and he financed it, but he got the town uh, to agree to it because he agreed by contract that he would never charge rents above HUD's you know, level. Um, so he's, he's built oh, interesting. It himself. So he didn't. So you know, we're gonna have to think about like, how do we wanna design um, our own communities. And, and I will just go off on a little riff now on, um, on some of the work we've been doing, which is like, it's really important for women in particular to talk to, to get involved in municipal processes like comprehensive planning um, and to start um, saying, you know, we want to develop the kinds of housing that we can live in here in our communities when we're 80 and 90. And, you know, like we want to figure out how to do that. Um, mm -hmm. and, uh, and we also have to, by the way, the other piece, the last piece, and I'll be done, have to tap this um, housing with services problem. We've got lots and lots of housing, particularly filled with women who are low income, living alone. These are the women we're talking about in this report, and they're aging in place without services because they can't afford it. And needing to figure out how do we layer services in? How could we create a village like within an apartment building, right? The village to village model, right? Maybe something like that. Um, we just have to be more creative um, in, in thinking about our housing solutions. So I'll stop, Desti. I, I, I uh, would be way over my head to be talking about housing policy because that is, that is well outside my expertise. Um, and I happen to know that there are folks like Representative Morales here on the call who know quite a lot about it. Um, but I, you know, I will say what I can say is as a community member, what I see is that there's low hanging fruit that we're just not being creative enough about. I happen to live on a street where all of the houses were built in 1920 in like Sears and Roebuck catalog. <laughs> Uh, you know, in, in Bath, it's very cute street, um, multi-generational, not a single house has a first floor bathroom. My beloved neighbors just had to leave after 30 years uh, because 
they couldn't, the cost of putting in a first floor bathroom so that they could age there was prohibitive. Um, is that really what we want? Like people that have to leave their town? Uh, I have another neighbor who is entering early Alzheimer's and they can't afford to retrofit their house to be able to keep her there safely. Uh, I have another neighbor who recently said that they might have to leave because Bath is just not big enough to sustain the kind of services they might need over time. Um, and there's not enough public transportation and accessibility to get to a service hub. Mm -hmm. um, these are, you know, there's a bigger housing question to solve that I do not know the answers to, but I feel sure that we could support families to stay in their homes mm -hmm. um, with, you know, universal design like grab bars. Mm -hmm. Just seems, that seems like really straightforward. I'm, I'm waiting to see an HGTV show that does that that shows here's here's a way you can modify your home and age in place and you can have a competition um, because I think that's really top of mind for a lot of people. So yeah. There are many specialists, by the way, who help you do that. And, and I should say um, our top goal has been, while we we're not, we don't have houses and people are living in houses that don't work for them. Dusty is a perfect example. Um, I mean, it's we, the stories we hear about people crawling up and down the stairs on their hands and knees is really bad. Um, just to, you know, once a week to take a shower um, and the rest you can imagine. Um, so, uh, you know, home repair and modification is, is the thing. And, you know, um, that's another place where we could spend a lot more money and help a lot more people um, and um, go beyond the model we have right now. So Maine Housing has a, pro a program called um, Community Aging in Place. Yes, Community Aging in Place it used to be called something else, so I have to remember. Um, and they work with um, some of the public housing authorities to do uh, simple home repair and modification. The problem is we don't have a vision for how everyone can access this. Right now, it's just some communities. And we're not um, capitalizing on the volunteer workforce we have here in, in Harpswell, where Carol and I live, since we're neighbors, and she's disclosed that we have our Harpswell Aging at Home. We have a volunteer cadre of 26 guys um, who um, work with Habitat for Humanity, Seven Rivers, um, and they have repaired and modified over 125 homes in Harpswell over the last six years for almost no money. It's like $2,000, they weatherized them too. They've saved lives, they've made it possible for people to remain in their community, um, in their homes, safely warmer and drier. That's their you know, take on it, but we still haven't, um, we haven't invested, like, so I've talked to all the habitats, they're ready to go. They love this model, they'd actually like to expand. Like, why aren't we doing that in every community, right? Why aren't we saying, who do we have? We've got CAPS, we've got uh, habitats, and we've got public housing authorities. Let's draw circles around all of them. Let's figure out what the model looks like. You know, how do we uh, motivate a bunch of volunteers um, to get involved in, in helping their neighbors stay in their communities? Um, it doesn't have to be all government. We have to pay for the materials, right? Because the, the flip side, and we're seeing this all, all the time, right? Uh, uh, Senator Collins and Senator King just made it possible to put, put a lot more weatherization dollars in Maine. That's great. We don't have any workers. And if there is to, to, to install the weatherization, but, but there are all these requirements that come with federal weatherization. So if you have a broken window, you don't qualify. If you've got mold, you don't qualify. If you've got, you know, any sort of um, something that has to be, you don't qualify for this weatherization money and there's nobody to do the home repair. So we got to figure out, right? We've got the money flowing, but we don't have workers there even to do that. And then we don't have workers to do the home repair. So we need to invest in all of the systems and we have to have like a vision for how, and there is money for this. The home fund could pay, for tens of thousands of people to have their homes modified mm. uh, in Maine. And uh, we, we just haven't gotten there yet. We need to. Well, so Jess, actually you, you made, you just ticked off a few examples of some successes, but so for instance, the model of Harpswell Aging at Home, a partnership with Habitat for Humanity and, and local volunteers. Where else are you seeing innovation? Um, 
you know, like where, where are people doing it right? Either other states, other countries, or where are the lessons um, that, we can, that we can steal um, <laughs> and apply them here in Maine? Well, um, I mean, there are, um, so I wanna just say Maine is a leader. Um, and, and every time we look outside, we ask that question of our national organizations, who's doing this right, particularly PHI, which is our, you know, the, the, the national guru um, organization for direct care workforce stuff. They're like, yeah, you're, you're doing everything you can do, <laughs> you know? So, I mean, we're, you know, we do keep reaching out and some of it is like, there are really great things happening in some other states like Washington State, Oregon, have got some really great like programs but the way long-term supports and services work is like once you're wedded to something, you have to like, you can't just take something from other st other states and put it in your, your program. You have to blow your whole program up. So we keep learning and then not doing um, some things. So there are some good models like sort of around benefits and those sorts of things um, that we could do better. Um, there's also some really great dementia friendly uh, work going on. Minnesota in particular is really, really terrific um, around like small micro um, uh, community based initiatives that help caregivers and people living with dementia in the communities, you know, sort of live more safely. Um, but Maine has got, you know, Maine's home to about 125 communities out of 500 who are doing some sort of lifelong community initiative or aging in place initiative. We've got neighbors driving neighbors, neighbors to neighbors. We've got, um, you know, Saco is I mean, just an amazing example of an age-friendly community. We've got villages. Um, I think I think one of the people who runs the village at Home Down East is, is here on the call. Um, there are really good models that Maine has implemented. Um, again, you know, uh, the, the habitat model is a terrific model, um, but we're, uh, you know, we're still we can't manufacture people, which is a which is a real problem. Um, you know, like um, we're using technology. I would say Maine is is trying everything. We're also the um, we're the leading leading edge uh, of the aging demographic in the country. Um, so Maine, Vermont, and New Hampshire. Um, we've been learning from Vermont, New Hampshire for the last eight years through the Tri-State Learning Collaborative on Aging and. Um, you know, we're we I think we're we're doing a really good job, uh, but it's just um, it's hard. I would just say it's really hard. You know, we we're looking at volunteer transportation programs. We're looking at how to, um, you know, that's something that's happening all around. And and also, right, we haven't cracked the rural transportation problem anywhere in this country. Um, so the things that we're grappling with are our workforce, housing. And transportation. Um, and, you know, I mean, I want to get back to this report, right, and the gender bias, it means that if, if you don't have enough money to make, meet your basic needs, right, and particularly if you think about the economics that are happening right now, so our, our CMP bills are going through the roof, and gas costs have gone through the roof, and the cost of, like, basic foods gone through the roof, and so, you know, you were doing this formula before, this who do I pay, um, you know, uh, do, you know, do I only eat meal one, one meal a day? I keep my, you know, thermostat at 50. I think we're going to find a lot of people who just can't do it anymore. Mm -hmm. And and we're seeing more and more homelessness in Southern Maine of older people. Um, and it's just going to impact women more. It's going to be older women who are living alone. Um, it's just much easier when you have two incomes. So I think the woman that asked the question about, you know, how do we band together? I think that's a really good question. Um, I don't have an answer for it, but I feel like, you know, the home share piece is one. Um, but I think we do have to think about like, how do we, as women, as entrepreneurial women, start organizations that support other women um, in, in aging well? Um, so, yeah. Good. Dusty, what about you? What, where do you see innovation? Where are there some lessons we can learn besides Finland? <laughs> well, you know, I, I, one of the things I wanted to pick up on is, is some of what Jess was talking about in terms of, you know, not having the, the care workforce or even just the workforce writ large. And I think there's a really good question in the Q&A about how we build that vibrant workforce. Um, and I think that we are seeing um, that across the country, people are saying in order to have a vibrant workforce, we need to care for the 
workers in that workforce. We need to give them the systems and tools and supports to be able to both be workers and be family members and care for their family members. So we know that 10 states plus the District of Columbia already had systems like paid family and medical leave. Um, Maryland and Delaware just passed those. I think the ink isn't even dry on Delaware's uh, bill. Uh, so you know now we're looking at 13, 14 states. Um, and that is because people are seeing that these systems are working. I think early uh, paid family and medical leave systems were starting modestly. Um, you know, can we do four weeks? Could we do six weeks? As time has passed, we've really seen that in fact, small businesses are able to attract and retain workers longer. Um, they have fewer turnover costs. They're better able to manage and support, like uh, stabilize their own internal costs. And it's good for the workers and families. We see better results in terms of um, being able to provide care for aging folks, being able to provide uh, you know, breastfeeding and vaccines, which has lifelong impacts, uh, reduced incidences of um, family violence when people are able to, to connect with resources mm -hmm. um, you know, in their own families, in their own communities. So in fact, many states that have come back to change their paid family and medical leave systems are doing so to add more time, as much as 20 weeks, 26 weeks even now, which seems mind blowing for you know, typical Americans who like, let's remember that a quarter of all women go back to work 10 days after giving birth. So to imagine something like 26 weeks is, is really, um, you know, seems next level. But in fact, states are finding that they can afford to do it because it's working. It's stabilizing their workforce. It's helping them attract workers. It's helping families stay stable and cared for and in their own homes. So, you know, we're, we are watching what innovation looks like in other states. They're making the investment to make a policy choice. Mm -hmm. Cool. Well, we're almost at the point where we're going to take the questions from the audience, but I, but I, I wanted to ask this, this last question. And, and that is that part of what makes this topic so challenging it is, is that it's the culmination of so many other inequities, the pay inequity, gender discrimination, inadequate resources for rural communities, uh, healthcare disparities, it can go on and on and on. And I think it's really easy for people to feel overwhelmed. I get very discouraged when I look at issues like pay inequity because I remember marching on my college campus back in the mid 70s for pay equity. And here it is 40 some years later and we're still dealing with it. Um, so that said, uh, let's not feel overwhelmed. And, and with that, so if you could each pick one policy change that could be done immediately and one that could be executed over the long term that you think would most have an impact for helping uh, Mainers age well, um, what would they be? And, and right after that, we'll, we'll go right to the questions from our audience. So, uh, so go ahead, whichever of you, whomever wants to start. I'm jumping in. Um, I, I have I've rung my paid family and medical leave gong through start to finish. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> your message, Jesse. <laughs> to me, it's it's every it's every piece. It's so many layers for workforce, for family care, um, and for gender equity, and also racial equity. Mm -hmm. um, so I just it really feels like one of those cross cutting um, things that that we absolutely could implement. It is not super cheap to implement, but it is not super expensive. We're talking about 38 to $40 million, which we had this year, and we could have again if we made that choice and for a self-sustaining program. So we set it up and then people pay in, it acts like an insurance system and it self-sustains. That for me feels like a, you know, we absolutely could do that. Um, in the near term, there is a commission that is working on developing a plan for Maine. 
Um, they were supposed to report out this year, had a couple bumps and bruises along the way, but they will be reporting out a plan um, by November 2nd. Um, so we have in our near future, like a possible pathway towards something that helps people across, you know, generationally, and that addresses the gender equity issue because we know that it is largely women who are being harmed by the lack of a system like this. And then for the long-term solution, I would say looking at something like a universal basic income. I think that is, you know, something that we really have to talk and think through what that is, what it looks like, but that's the kind of thing that provides a floor for everyone so that we are not talking all the time about how do we fix the healthcare system? How do we fix the you know, wage inequities in certain industries? How do we fix, like, that's a floor. A universal basic income ensures that people are not having to make these grotesque choices between food and medication. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. And how about you, Jess? So I've already uh, suggested what I, you know, think is um, the, sh the really sort of low, low hanging short term free fruit, which is to change the eligibility limits uh, levels um, based on, um, you know, and I, and I think we can talk about what that is, but the Elder Economic Security Index, um, looking at what a person needs to meet their basic needs, if, you know, they're living in Maine, and they are, I mean, it doesn't ad address disparities. I will tell you, you know, I just looked at the, the data and 26% um, of older people over 65 rent in Maine, which is a little bit high for, I think. And 46% of them statewide are rent burdened. So, and then when you get in Cumberland County, it's 50, over 50% um, in, in many of those. And so, you know, it's not, I don't know what the right number is, but we're going to have to figure that out. What's the right number with the elder economic security? Is it renters, you know, <laughs> renters in good health, maybe, I don't know, to sort of bring up um, the, um, the money in people's pocket. That's to me, for, the, for women who are living in this situation, and you can do it, you know, you can actually do it for an individual and, a, you know, two people. And so you're, it, you're there is, you know, it's, it's, it's again, if you do that, you're raising the boats for, for mostly women who are living alone. Mm -hmm. um, and so to me, that it creates an immediate um, uh, bump, and particularly the Medicare Savings Program. But I think we're going to explore what other um, programs in addition to that we could do. But, you know, we, and I'm also thinking about, you know, how do we create funding parity for supports um, for older people, which we don't even have close to. And I could regale you with stories about how we fund children and we don't fund older adults. So that's going to get to my longer term piece, which is we have to have conversations about ageism. And it's a long term and a short term piece. Um, so we've been doing this power and aging project uh, for a year now, and it's based on this premise people in America, and this is based on empirical research, don't believe ageism is a thing. They don't actually believe it's true. And if it is, it's not as bad as homophobia or racism. I mean, that's this is what Americans believe. We don't have to believe it, but it's, it's really true. Um, but understanding our own age bias actually results in people not acting on it and results in more support for these kinds of things. And what we need to do is shift shift the conversation from the individual to the collective. And that's really what we know needs to happen, right? And I hear all the time, and this goes back to one of the things Desti said about the expectations of women. I hear from legislators all the time, actually just from a municipal, from a, a town councilor the other day, in my day, it's always predicated by that. We <laughs> took care of our families, took care of their older people. Read, women didn't work. <laughs> that's what that means. In my day, people took care of families means women didn't work. And so that's still the expectation is that if somebody in a family needs to be taken care of, it's the woman who's leaving the workplace. Um, and so, you know, we have to have these conversations about bias generally, but we have to dig deep on ageism um, because uh, this is what happens where you get that in the mix, right? So somebody needs care. 
we should be caring about that. This is the older person who needs care. And then we're saying, oh, and it's you, young woman, you're responsible for taking care of her. And we don't really care what happens to you. So we, we have to have the conversation about ageism. It's real. It impacts our economy, our, our workforce. You know, why making Maine work in, in 2013 said the best solution to our workforce problems was putting people age 65 and over back to work. <laughs> We haven't done that. And matter of fact, it's gotten worse. And so you have to ask why in seven or eight years we haven't acted on that. And it's ageism. Um, absolutely there when we talk to employers. Um, so, you know, it's not doing us any favor. It's actually holding us back. And I think once we can talk about our own age bias, we can start talking, looking at these intersections um, and understanding um, why we need to act correct, uh, really historic um, um, discrimination just generally, so. Wow, that's a strong point to end our uh, our little, the discussion part um, of our forum on. Uh, so now let's segue in um, and take some questions from our audience. And this one was, the first one I'm going to offer was submitted uh, with a registration. So I hope this person is still here. Is there any movement to make long-term care insurance accessible as part of aging in place? I recently received information from AARP about insurance providers and contacted them. It is prohibitively expensive. Um, what can we do about that? Are there any affordable options out there? So that was, let's ask that question. You could say yes or no. <laughs> the answer is no. There is um, no affordable yes. option. There, yeah, there, I mean, there, there isn't. And yeah, I mean, it's, it, it's such a crapshoot and we have very few providers, you know, the long, main long-term care um, insurance program really just protects your assets um, from, you know, your heirs, you know, um, I mean, it, it allows, it protects your assets so that your heirs have something to, right. um, uh, sure. you know, inherit. Um, most of us are going to have to use everything we have. Um, I mean, Maine is, we haven't even talked about unaffordability just generally of long-term support services in Maine. I mean, it's, we're like the 46th and 50th for, for affordability with right. home care, long-term and, and nursing home care. So um, we're not going to be able to afford it. Um, and, you know, long-term care, ins care insurance, again, is a crapshoot. I, I know people with policies who need to be institutionalized, uh, you know, in a facility and the long-term care policy is only for home care. Well, it's not, it's not, you know, it's a crapshoot um, when you're getting these policies, whether they're going to work for you um, and they are very expensive. Um, so, um, and we don't have many of them. So no. Okay. Okay. Let's, um, let's go to the first question in the queue, Strawberry. Uh, what can be done to assist older women in the short term with all of the rising costs? Some of us still have a mortgage. Also, uh, will the proposed index affect Social Security benefits? Not here in Maine. That's a federal, Social Security is a federal um, uh, program. Um, and it wouldn't, uh, what it would do is to increase, um, so the Medicare savings program essentially uh, pays for parts of your Medicare premium, reducing your costs, and you actually get a hundred dollars, hundred and something dollars extra from what's called the low income subsidy, which the federal government pays for. Um, so that's why the Medicare savings program is such a win if we could increase the eligibility because it would actually get money in people's pockets without, um, without uh, any, any penalty. Right, so it doesn't impact negatively on on anything. Um, you know, I I would say, I mean, it, you know, again, there. No, I mean, there aren't any um, places. You know, I think I, what I, I guess what I would say for everybody here is your area agency on aging, and we can certainly make sure you have the list of all of them. Um, Strawberry and Carol, um, your area agency on aging in Maine. Um, is the place you go to for answers on aging. And what they can do for you is called a benefits checkup. Um, and again, you know, we may not be able to solve your um, challenges related to your expenses, but we might be able to save you money by getting you onto benefits that you might not know you qualify for. So that's a real gainer and a real win. And I know, and, and you know, even just looking at whether you're in the right Medicare 
program can save um, a lot of money for people. So, hey, thank you very much for um, mm -hmm. for that. But um, so that so connecting with the area agencies on aging. The other thing that just happened, and and a real big shout out to Senator Donna Bailey. Oh, I'll tell you, this woman, she for six years. <laughs> Um, brought uh, uh, the property tax, the main property tax relief um, program uh, up in the legislature and, 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 you know, would get to the appropriations table and it died, but it, it actually got passed last year and funded and now it's actually implemented. So I do want to say this is a new program and, and people should know about it, which is to say, if you can't afford your property taxes, you can actually apply for this program um, and it's very reasonable in relation to qualification. What it does is you basically, you, the, the state takes a lien on your property and they pay your property taxes. And it doesn't impact anything. You don't have to sell your home. You can die in your home. What it does is it, once you know, you're gone, whether you sell it or you, you know, whatever, um, then the state just takes out what it, what it put in <laughs> And then the rest of it still goes to your heirs. So it's a really terrific prop, uh, you know, uh, program for folks um, who are struggling to pay their property taxes. And again, is a really good option um, uh, to get to get money in people's pockets. That's the way I keep looking at it. That's good information. I wasn't aware of that um, of that property tax relief program. Dusty, do you have anything to add to that? I would. I would echo what Jess said about, you know, those local resources that act as navigators. And I think there are other navigator kinds of resources like that. I think of things like um, CAKE, uh, Consumers for Affordable Health Care, who, you know, have at points had navigators there on staff who can help you figure out what you're eligible for in terms of health care, um, you know, what your main care might look like or Medicare. So. I think that those navigator programs are really like undervalued and, and under accessed because so, there are sometimes things that do exist that people just simply don't know about. Um, and then in terms of the keep putting people in, in putting money in people's pockets, this is, you know, one bill that that I was thinking of that is a little bit more of a long term solution. But last year, Senator Vitelli, Eloise Vitelli, who has been such a champion of both um, older people and of women and uh, working women in Maine for so many years, uh, put forward a bill that passed that allows women, oh, excuse me, allows um, all workers to be able to set aside um, part of their paycheck into an automatic account that is for their own retirement. Um, and so it's a state facilitated program but it's for folks who are really working in small employers or self-employed who really just don't have access to like a 401k kind of program. And it's, uh, you know, it's a modest but important way of helping support people to, to use their own resources for that kind of long-term snowball. We know that long-term savings is where it's at in terms of, um, you know, compound interest and having um, a base to retire on. And I think this is the kind of like easy and innovative program that helps people use the resources that they do have. Mm -hmm. um, I really commend um, Senator Vitelli for thinking outside the box in this way. Can I, can I offer one more um, thought, um, which is the Senior Companion Program and the Foster Grandparent Program here in Maine. Um, and they're terrific programs for people who are lower income. I don't know what the eligibility is, but it's basically, it's like an AmeriCorps program almost. So you can um, earn essentially tax-free dollars. Again, it's not a huge amount of money. So you volunteer in the Senior Companion Program or the Foster Grandparent Program. And, uh, and you can earn, I'm going to say it's like up to six thousand dollars tax free. It's all. It, I mean, it doesn't impact anything. It doesn't benefit. So it, you know, it's not considered income, um, and uh, and it's great because you know one of the things I'll tell you is we live longer when we live with purpose, um, and a lot of times what happens when you are experiencing um, not enough resources, though your world shuts down, right? 
So you drive less, right? You don't do the things you want. You don't, you know, you don't spend money on things. So your world may shrink. And so this is just another opportunity also, you know, to give back, to feel great about what you're doing and to earn some money that doesn't impact your social security or your rent subsidy or those sorts of things. Great. Thank you. Those are really good suggestions from both of you. Um, how about another question, Strawberry? Uh, for women in Maine over age 65, what is the average income? Are women relying on Social Security alone? So there was a lot of detail in the report about this information. And I, I, I'm just jumping in here to say that um, if you look at the report, there's all kinds of analytics in there in terms of income earned over a period of a, of a career, um, what the typical retirement draw is for women versus men, um, what the typical social security uh, payments are. I, I mean, Jess or Desti, if you want to offer out some of the, you know, some of that data, uh, that's fine. But I, but I know that there's a tremendous amount of data in that USM report that's very specific to earning power um, of women. Yeah, I'm looking at the, um, I'm sorry, I'm looking at the report trying to find the answer really quickly, but it's not coming immediately up. Maybe um, we could take another question and um, Kim Snow or Elizabeth Gatine will jump in and put it in the chat. I don't, I don't know the well, answer. Well, for the median income, according to my notes, for um, a woman, uh, a woman who's uh, 65 or over is 22,000. Uh, 059 and a man is 27,008. I just got to the same figure yeah. right there. Yeah. Yep, I'm, I'm looking at it. Um, and yep. Also, the I mean that the the difference in um, we didn't talk about this, um, but I just I guess I just want to say, um, look, <laughs> Kim Snow, I feel good better now that she's saying she was trying to. Um, <laughs> I just want to, I mean, one of the pieces of this report that's I guess heartbreaking to me is that the poverty level for women over 80 is twice as high as it is for men. And, you know, I mean, that's, I mean, <laughs> that's rough stuff um, to, I mean, it's, it's, it's disparity all across, you know, from men, men to women, but, uh, but it's really stark in your 80s. Yeah. Um, and I, I'll put another plug in for something I didn't mention, but it's something we're doing um, all the time. Um, which is disaggregating data um, and particularly like no longer looking at people over the age of 65 or, you know, we're now looking at men and women over the age of 65 and people of color over the age of 65 and people over 80 and people who are in different age bands to see, you know, who is really, because why, what, does it really make sense, right, to talk about any group of people that include five decades? Like, can you say anything about them at all? I mean, no, you can't say a thing about them, you know, that is in common. So um, really starting to look at, um, at, at slicing and dicing data so that we understand more um, how our policies impact people. Mm -hmm. And I'll, I'll say this last piece, which is like, we talk a lot about age segregation, right? So if you can't f stay in your home and uh, you can't find home care, then nursing home care or assisted living is, is all you've got. And you know it's very likely going to rip you out of your community, away from your home, if you're not an English speaker, away from anybody um, that speaks your language. Um, and um, and it's mostly women who are in the situation, you know, um, because you have to, to to qualify under main care. You have to both be you know nursing home eligible. We have a very high acuity level, and you have to be poor. Um, and so it's really important to understand that this age segregation. We don't want to see aging. We don't. You know, we haven't built the, the, we haven't invested in the infrastructure that keeps people in their communities, right? Because we actually don't want to see old people or aging them back to ageism again. We age segregate them, but that age segregation has a much bigger impact on women. And we should also be looking at that because if we were doing that to people who were, you know, have behavioral health challenges these days, we would be, we would be yelling about that. We don't right. do that anymore, right? right. So that's right. still what we do for older people. And it's what we're doing for older women mostly. Right. And, it's and that when we disaggregate the data in that way, we get much closer to the heart of the kinds of inequity and oppression that we've been talking about throughout here. You know, 
just like when we talked about pay disparity and the difference between not just women and men, but Latinx women and white women. Like we need to be pulling those pieces apart because otherwise it gives us an excuse to continue ignoring or looking away. And we absolutely, we have to um, take seriously the way that these layers of different kinds of inequities um, pile on. I can only imagine that if we had the data to be able to show not just the difference in poverty between women and men in their older years, but could also break it down by race, we would see another piece of information that would be incredibly powerful. Right now we have to surmise, but we can do a better job with our data systems and do a better job with our policies for really trying to un, you know, dis, un, unroot like these inequities. And that's only gonna happen when we start really looking at it in the face. That was one of the conclusions in the USM report was that what that really underscored the need to desegregate data to get a clearer picture of, um, of trends and impact. Let's take another question, uh, Strawberry. Sure. Uh, what are thoughts on making it easier for adult children of aging parents to get mortgages or assistance or support for building, modifying, or purchasing homes with an independent living space for those parents? All for it. <laughs> do, you, do you know, are, are banks making any sort of accommodation for that or is, or is anyone making an accommodation to make it easier? Not that you're, not that you guys are aware of. Again, I don't want to, you know, I, I don't want to disparage anybody. Sometimes when right. I say things, I don't right. really like say things, um, but, um, uh, but credit unions do a much better job generally than banks mm -hmm. um, in accommodating these kinds of things. Um, they, you know, everybody needs equity, but I actually had a couple of banks say to me, oh no, if you've got an 80 year old, it doesn't matter that they have um, uh, income if they built an ADU uh, accessory dwelling unit, sorry, and um, we're going to rely on rent from their rental property, that wouldn't work because we have to have two years worth of demonstrated rent to be able to loan the money. And, you know, and I talked to a credit union, a couple of credit unions, they're like, yeah, no, we'd lend you the money. So, uh, you know, I, I don't know of anybody that's doing anything um, specific to this, um, but uh but we could certainly talk, we could certainly try to help people. Okay. And how about another question, Strawberry? We're almost out of time here. Sure. Uh, would a social security tax credit assist those of us who were caregivers in the past or would this only be for current caregivers? You know, that's an interesting question. And that, that would be the kind of thing that in the policymaking process, you know, we would really want to be hearing from directly affected folks and thinking about how we can build out a system that does look back. Typically, laws don't look back in that way. Uh, they tend to be from today and forward. But I think we need to recognize the ways that the inequities baked into our system have created a, a scenario where, you know, women are entering older age at twice the levels of poverty than men. And do something system-wide to rectify it. Whether it's social security credit or something like that, I think remains to be seen, but I think we have a responsibility and a duty to do better by our people. And we have an opportunity to do better by our people. Good, good. Let's take the last question. So that will make me feel like we didn't leave anyone hanging. <laughs> Uh, have we figured out which specific income levels are most at risk to the impact of current policies who could be persuaded to take action? Are those two separate questions? Who could be, who could be persuaded to take action? Or is it based on the, in, can you tell, Strawberry? Uh, it looks like it's one question, like what, what are the income levels for people who would be most affected who could be motivated to take action because they are going to be the most affected? I'll jump in again and say that, you know, one of the things we see are that the folks who have less access to resources or less economic security or stability, um, and often the people who are most directly affected by policy changes or um, inaction on policy 
are in many cases the people least likely to be able to take action because their lives ne don't necessarily have space for action. Um, and that's to some extent by design. So, you know, I don't have an answer for your question, but I have hope that will continue to make better pathways for the people who are really affected by the policy positions that we're talking about here to help them become like leaders and activists in this work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I would say, you know, just, uh, you know, you know, uh, purely uh, for uh, understanding your own economic status, read this report. Um, because, um, yeah. First of all, um, they, Muskie did a terrific job of explaining the Elder Economic Security Index and how it relates to whether you live alone or not, and whether you're in good, poor, excellent health, whether you rent, whatever. So take a look at that. But I will say, you know, if you earn less than thirty thousand dollars, you're going to be impacted by this, and you aren't going to be able to afford, um, long, and you live alone, long-term care, um, and many of the other things. Uh, that are there, and so you should um, act act up now. Um, and we we would love to help you uh, do that. That's a great way to end this conversation. Act up now. You guys will help. Um, thank you so much. So to the audience members, these were great questions, and um, and also to our sponsors for making this possible, but especially to Desti and Jess, you guys. You presented so much information and some imaginative solutions. I was taking notes the whole time. So for folks in the audience, as, as Strawberry has been putting in the chat, this was recorded and we will make it available on our website, but also you all will get emailed uh, the recording with some takeaways. It'll be hard to distill where there's so much information here, uh, but with some takeaways and, and hopefully you'll be able to use that information um, in your own lives. So thank you again to our attendees. Thank you, Strawberry, for doing a great job behind the scenes. Thanks again to our sponsors. And most especially, thank you, Jess, and thank you, Desti. You guys are really working to make Maine a better place for everyone, and we appreciate that. And with that, good night, everyone. Thank you for hosting. Yeah. Be well, everyone. <laughs>